You're listening to The Harbor Light Show, a podcast that discusses how people make sense of and assign meaning to their experiences. My name is Dr. Kenneth Erickson, and I hold a doctorate in the field of health psychology. In addition, I'm a practicing chiropractor, a martial artist, and a seeker of truth and authenticity. Join me, along with other fellow travelers, as we discuss the lessons they've learned in their travels and the impact those lessons have had on their lives. All right, Terry, thanks, man, for, for doing this. So this is the first attempt at having some kind of a podcast. Um, it'd probably be good to talk a little bit about how we know each other, I guess, because I've known you for, I don't know, as long as I can remember, really. Do you remember how we met? Yeah, I think, you know, two or three years ago. Yeah. Because, you know, we're only in our mid-20s. Yeah, so. right, right. No, I have, my brother used to be a member of the Y, and he would go to the, the gentleman's part of the Y where he wore a polo shirt and still worked out in the Nautilus Center. Mm -hmm. And I was a high school football player at Frewsburg, and he somehow poked his head in that that cave of the weight room down there and found you guys working out and brought me up to meet you there. Yeah, yep, yep. He came up to me one day and Hmm. said, hey, would you mind teaching my little brother how to work out? Because at that time I was running the weight room. I was president of the weight room. And I said, yeah, bring him down. And then he brought you down. <laughs> and I don't know how old you were, 16 maybe, something like yeah, that? Yeah, like a junior in high school, 16, 17. Yeah, and I turned around. <laughs> I'm like, what in the hell? I'm looking at you. I was like, oh, my God, you know. You know I'll never forget what that room looked like. It's, you have the Nautilus Center in front of you when you're going down the hall. And then the dungeon corridor to the left, that big, giant brown door, and you, you'd open that up and, and go in and there was every single kind of human you know in that place yeah it was kind of like a portal into a whole nother world and that's in those days what people forget or don't realize i think is weightlifting was not mainstream like it is now it was it was all of the uh kind of the uh i don't know what what you want to call it, the misfits yeah. it was a world of misfits and now today, everybody works out, right? And even in those days, coaches weren't too excited about you working out or they'd make they you muscle just, bound and make you slow. And yeah, but the weight room, we had, a, I mean, it was a cast of characters in that place. It was. I, you know, I, yeah, your different crews of people working out and some in their jeans and snakeskin cowboy boots and right. other people in their workout gear. It was just, I remember walking in and little did I know 25 years later, it might have been one of the biggest moments of my life finding the weight room. Oh yeah. So I've I've never found anything that challenges in like your inner challenge. Like nobody can take it from you. Nobody can judge you. It's not like playing a sport where they coach you and they can start you or sit you. Uh, it's you against the machines. Yeah. Right. And whatever you worked at, you earned. Yep. Uh, I loved it. No, I say the same thing. I, I never found truth in the world the way I found in the weight room, and then later in later years, grappling. So that brings us to that whole thing. So I got to know you back then. Then I went away to college. I went away to chiropractic college. That would have been 1993. And I remember, and so in 93, that's, so I went to St. Louis. That was the year the UFC came out. And I had a roommate that was into karate, and I had no respect for martial arts whatsoever. I thought it was all a bunch of nonsense. And I didn't think it had any ap- real appli- you know, uh, application to a fight in the street. or I'd been in a few confrontations, and <laughs> I didn't think it was anything. And he kept telling me about the UFC, UFC, and you got to see this. And, that. and then finally I watched it, and I thought, well, this is a bunch of nonsense. I don't get this. Like, what is this guy doing? And I, couldn't, I, I got the, the striking part. I got it when the guys you know, would, would beat the living hell out of each other. But I didn't get the grappling part. And as luck would have it, I knew a guy who – who found a school, J. DeMondo School down in St. Louis, those guys were already training under Hoist Gracie's brother Hickson. Hickson was, and Steve Yant, who I'm still really good friends with to this day, he was Hickson's representative at the time in St. Louis. So I went down there and got introduced to grappling. And that's, a whole, that's another story. But yeah. eventually I came back here, and nobody grappled here at that time. Nobody. And you were the very first guy... And I ran into you working Great. out at the yeah. at the weight uh, the abs I think it was yeah. right, and we went in a little yoga room there and we had a little we had a little uh, yeah 
impromptu grappling session. Now, how big were you at that time? See, that's, it's so interesting because when I started lifting way back when I met you, you were big and powerful, national team powerlifting champion. So I had these goals. I was a big kid, but just natural big, which was fat, right? And so I wanted to get big and powerful. So as you took that path, we kind of, before cell phones and texting and all that, I went to Temple University and played football and I got bigger. Uh, by the time I come out of there, I was about 330, cut away a lot of the fat and, and was an athlete. And I remember when I first ran into you again at the athletic body shop, you were trim. Right. Like I might've had a hundred pounds on you, mm -hmm. you know? And for a minute I was like, oh I, yeah. I was even less. I weighed maybe 220, 215. I remember you took a pencil, eraser sign and stuck it into your ab muscles. That's how thick, so you had all the power lifting abs, mm -hmm. then trimmed it all. I, I was, was like, ripped, yeah. I was shocked, cool. but I definitely thought, hmm, I'm bigger than you right now. And you were way bigger. I was. I probably weighed 215 or something. Yeah, it didn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we end up grappling. And if I remember, <laughs> we were a bloody mess at the end of it. I, I was a pretty bloody mess, yes. <laughs> but Eight. that that was the very first, so then, the, after that, I went down to a, there hmm. was a little movie Monigans, or I think it was called, and a little movie place oh, where Matt. The who, TV, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where Matt actually worked. On Fairmount. And I went down to get a movie, and he's sitting in there watching uh, this stuff on a video. And I said, hey, man, you into that? You into grappling? Like, yeah, yeah. You want to learn some? From who? I said, from me. So no one did it. That Those guys yeah, were doing it, but they were learning it from tapes and what they could watch. Right. So then that's how the whole, we all started. There was him, and I forget, Joe Janko and his brother. Um... And so we all got together, and that was the beginning of the of the grappling, really. And that was up in uh, uh, that little yoga room she let me use. BJ let me yeah. use that little room. So that's how it all got started. And then and then I took anybody, anyone who wanted to come and grapple. I didn't care who you were. Everybody was welcome. And that's and I just started going. And then at that time, I was still going back to St. Louis to train. And um, but eventually, I got to a point where. You know, I've been, do been doing it for a while here, and there wasn't anybody here who did it. So they always say you have to have three fighters in your life to progress optimally. you got to have the guy that you're better than, the guy you're equal to. He gets you sometimes, and he you get him. And then you got to have the guy who's way better than you. you got to have your teacher. And I didn't really have that at the time, so I called Jay D'Amato and said, who's, who's the best grappler in the world? And he said, Gokar Shavishian's the best all-around grappler in the world. He's, I mean, he doesn't have any weaknesses. Like, a lot of guys were really good with groundwork but they didn't have any throws. They didn't any, have any takedowns. Then you had guys who were really good wrestlers. They could take you down. They could pin you, but they didn't know how to submit you. Then you had guys that were really good. They, they actually knew leg locks, but they didn't know. They weren't really good with anything else. Goker had, had it all. So I remember calling the guy. I got hold of his number, and I knew a guy who actually knew him, and I had just missed training with him the year I came back from St. Louis. He showed up and gave a seminar at the school I was training at in St. Louis, and I missed it. But I knew who he was. I'd been following his career. And I called him and left him a message, and he called me back. And, um, and, and then he invited me to go to Las Vegas. There was going to be a big thing, a big um, training thing out there with him, and Richard Bastillo was going to be there, which was one of Bruce Lee's guys. And So I flew out and met him and trained with him, and then he invited me out to California. I stayed with him at his house. And anyways, long story short, all these years later, Ended up finally getting a black belt under him. Eventually getting my Brazil, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt under Steve. And he's under Hoyler Gracie. So these are this is a pretty good pedigree. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is I never found anything else that gave the truth the way lifting did and grappling mm -hmm. did. Because as you said, sports, you can blame the coach. You can blame this other guy. Hey, man, you know, you missed that block. That's why I got tackled or what? I mean. Right. Y y or you don't like me. Right? You don't so. like me. It's not fair. But, you were, but in that world of grappling, it was really you against the other guy. And what amazed me, as you said, when I went out there, I was strong. I mean, I was benching a lot of weight and lifting, squatting a lot of weight. I knew I was, uh, I was stronger than everybody in that place. It didn't make a bit of difference. It did, and then you're, then, you're, then you're faced with the choice. Do you, <laughs> do you leave and make an excuse? Or do you face it and actually learn from it? Isn't that a character-defining moment? Because everybody's faced with that throughout life. Right. And one thing I've found from weightlifting and then grappling and martial arts is it's a 
great way to teach you about life. Yeah. It's, it's bigger than just yeah. fitness or muscle goals or self-defense or right. it's about life. It's about life. Now today I find like everybody, victimhood has become the, the new, the thing that's in. Everybody's somehow a victim and somebody's being unfair to them and how unfair the whole world. And in fact, you can even get, your status can increase. The more you can, more boxes you can check of how victimized you've been, the greater you're, you, you, you rise up in that, in that world. And, you know, to me in the weightlifting world, it really didn't matter. I mean, there were guys... And you had to accept the fact that not everybody had the same genetics, right? Not everybody. Now, you had legs like calves like a professional bodybuilder, but I don't remember you ever having to work those very much. Like, no, that's, you just yeah. walked around with them. And then other people had upper bodies that were like unbelievable and yet really didn't have any legs. And it didn't matter how much they trained them. They weren't going to. So there were some genetics, but you had to accept that fact. But no matter what your genetics were, you could still go beyond it. You could still improve it. Right. Right? There was always, and you had to put your work in. That's the part that I loved. Now, there were guys on roids, and I was so, I was so uh, ignorant about what was going on around me. I had no idea that most of the guys in the gym were juicing. I had no idea. Didn't even dawn on me because I never did any steroids at all. And I didn't know that there were even guys in the gym doing that. Then years later, you find out, oh, yeah, just about everybody was doing some kind of an anabolic. I got out of the drug-free powerlifting stuff when guys were competing in the drug-tested, and they were juiced. And, and it turned out it was like, well, can you, can you get a buy with it so you don't get caught? Right. But it was almost an accepted thing that you were going to do it. You were just going to do this because when it all costs. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to compete against your pharmacist or your whatever drug. You know, that, right. that wasn't cool. So then I got into grappling, and I thought, you know, th that's even better because there were guys doing steroids and stuff, but in that world, technique really rules the day more than, more than strength. Although strength counts, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but not to the degree that technique counts. And you can't get it other than put your work in. You have to keep showing up. So now we moved around the gym. I moved that school around many, many times. We had it all over the place, remember? Yeah. And I got tired of moving it. So I finally bought a little lousy, crappy building and put it in there, right? And that's where we trained for that, a long time. Yeah, we had places that didn't have heat. Oh, yeah. We trained on a Thanksgiving morning. Yeah. Remember on 2nd Street yeah. with a salamander heater. Yeah. Yeah, it was freezing cold and the mats were hard. Yep. All part of it, though, right? All part of that journey. So looking back on those times, like, what was the thing that, you, that sticks with you the most, would you say? I think for both of those, I got into it because I had a competitive personality. So I was driven to whatever, football, to be the best I could be, to be the strongest I could be, to... But really, where it ended up was the competition was inside me, mm. right? And the older I got, the more I needed that. The more what you bench at, at 50 years old doesn't matter. But whether or not I could overcome a divorce, mm. whether or not I was going to go through a, a hard time, it's not if but when as an adult you're going to go through hard times. And it was all the things I learned. That's what I can't get out. All the things I learned, discipline, integrity, and even, and even just companionship with my buddies there, but it allowed me not to fall down even further. That's really for me. So you, you enter the, remember I met you at abs that day. I was like 330, 40 pounds. I benched over 500 pounds then. And found out real quick that with technique from the grappling, you just simply used all my energy against me. Mm. It was a helpless feeling. I ate popsicles for two days <laughs> afterwards. There was nothing I could do. So now you go back, I'm not done with college. So I go back to finish up my senior year. I work security during the summer times at some clubs. And you, I call it the big man mentality. 6'4", 300 pounds, throw you through a wall if I had to. I didn't, didn't want to. But now I felt vulnerable again. Mm. And that drove me to when I come back home to find you again and mm -hmm. start. But, you know, so first it's competition and first it's self-defense. But really, it was about the principles on the wall. Yeah. 
and how they help me overcome just daily stress and challenges within myself. And that's what I remember. Um, it's, it trained me through a lifetime to deal with adversity when it comes. Those principles, you know, we did a bunch of those tapes. I got a whole bunch of them and just short little. The problem is when you hear them, it's not as effective as when you're training and you're having them explained. You right. know what I mean? And you're yeah. living them. And But all those principles, I picked them up over the years from a lot of different sources. Some of them were martial arts guys and some of them I might read them in a book or but I was always trying to relate the grappling and the and the fighting to the to the principles so that we could use them in life. And that was a that to me was the valuable and looking back I think there were a few guys who got that and valued that because I've had them tell me over the one guy, I forget his name. He's actually in California now. He's an ultra marathon runner. And he tells me, you know, I saw him oh, a couple of years ago, and he said, man, those, you know, the principles really carried me through. And But then there were guys who put up with them. <laughs> it was like they didn't give a damn about those principles. They wanted to train. They wanted the physical. They wanted the, the new technique or whatever, and they would kind of – they had to put up with it because I required it. You had to do right. it if you were there. And I know that for those guys, they probably weren't – they didn't get a lot out of it, probably because they weren't in a place in their life where they felt they needed it. But yeah, the, the principles for me were always the most important. Thing. I've told people over the years, there's a, I was an okay sport grappler. Like I was okay, but when I got started in '93, there wasn't even uh, there wasn't sport grappling. There, it didn't exist really. It was all about self defense grappling, and that's a big difference, right? People would look at some, a guy that was a black belt level guy then, and they would call him a blue belt today, or a purple belt because he's not doing the de la Hiva guard and the reverse <laughs> de la Hiva, and they, they're doing all these things. I don't even know what it is. But my question is always, can you pull that off if I'm punching you in the face? Yeah. Would you, could you pull all that off if I could kick you and headbutt you? And, because the truth is, you can't. That's a, it's a sport, right? And I don't have an issue with it. It's fine with me. As long as the guy or whoever it is that's teaching it doesn't give you a false sense of security that, hey, you could actually protect yourself in a fight with it. No, you can't. You're probably going to get the living hell beat out of you if you're doing it. So I have a little bit of problem with that. But beyond that, I don't have a problem with the sports stuff. It's just I wasn't interested in that. No, and I don't think from at least my inception of it, that was never what your club was about. No. It was about many different people, all different walks of life, yeah. all looking for something. And we seem to find it there. And, and the greatest, most peaceful part of that was you ran it in such a way that we felt comfortable with being exposed, yeah. with letting our weakness down, you know, and, and yeah, again, I'm speaking from a 50 year old tongue now Yeah, when I was 27 and doing it, it was just about, yeah, yeah, get down and train and work hard. But you just made that part of what we did knowing that someday we were going to need it. Yeah. Well, that brings up this next subject, which is the whole point of doing this, you know, this podcast is the idea of consilience. I was, when I was working on my doctorate in, in uh, England, our stateside hub was in Connecticut. It was a place called the Learning Collaborative, and that was um, not too far from Yale. And so we would go to these consiliency lectures at Yale University. And consiliency was a word that was coined by a guy named William uh, Huell, I think. He was, uh, he was a professor at Trinity College, Cambridge, and he, he coined that term, I think, in 1840, and, he, and it meant... Uh, jumping together from different classes of facts and information. It was linking of principles from different disciplines, especially when forming a comprehensive theory. So the idea is if we want to know how far, you know, let's say Jamestown is from Pittsburgh, whether I measure it with a tape measure, whether I measure it with a laser, those are two different technologies, whether I measure it with a GPS system off a satellite, I should come to the same conclusion. So the idea of consiliency is examining things from various perspectives to try to get to a certain base truth. You know, and when I was working on my doctorate, they talk about the transcendence, which was truth, beauty, and, and, uh, and goodness. And regardless of time, place, or location, that's kind of the fundamental things that people grapple with. What is true? Now, it used to be certain things were thought of as true like undeniable truth, male and female was a fun. Now today they question that, right? Now it's now it's cons now often it's considered a, a social construct. Uh, that yeah, there's the sexual or the biological, but then there's what you identify with, 
Well, that's a real clash of paradigms for some people. They're like, you know, you don't get just to make up your own realities. But now we're being, now there, it's being questioned, well, what is a reality? What isn't? What's true? Then it's speak your truth. And some people mm-hmm. are not comfortable with that because they'll say, look, you don't get to have just your truth. There's the thing that's true and the thing that's not true. Well, it depends, to me, it depends on what you're examining. Like if you say, is it raining? We could have a consensus about that. It's either true or it's not true. But when you ask someone to give their experience about life and they say, well, this is what was true for me, who am I to tell you that that wasn't true for you? Right, because your perception is your reality. Yeah, so, so in a way, I looked at the grappling and martial arts, and that's why I, was, I got to be known as a grappler, but that really wasn't true. I was just as interested in weapons, just as interested in stand-up. I was interested in all aspects of it because I was trying to get to what was true what was true about this? And, you know, a lot of guys, well, I wouldn't allow myself to be taken down. That was, that was you'd common with, with stand-up guys, right? You couldn't get me in a hold like that. And what would happen? They'd get, they'd get knocked on their ass and, and choked out or armbarred. Well, now you're, now you're up against the uh, – you have to deal with that. That was true, right? Right, yeah. So what's true for you? Can you move beyond it? Can you not move? Do you have to step away and then reconstruct history and tell silly stories about – you know, some nonsense that, that had no bearing on what actually occurred. But that was kind of my idea, and I don't think I put it in those words, but my, my th- thought was always, what's true about all this? What, can I, what fundamental thing can I get from studying all these different arts? And, um, and, and there's a beauty in it. There's a beauty, you know, you'll see, you, and people who don't, aren't fight fans have a hard time understanding that, but you'll watch a fight and the guy just gets knocked out with this perfect punch. And some guy like Joe Rogan will go, that, did you, it was beautiful. Yeah. How can it be beautiful when the guy's laying there unconscious, right? For some people, that was horrible. Right. It was barbaric. It was barbaric. And for this other guy, it was beautiful, right? Well, there's truth, there's beauty, and then there's justice. What's good? Some people define it as violence. I never did because for violence to occur, there has to be a victim. You can't have two people that decide to test themselves and then claim that it's violent. No, you're both willing to do it. You can quit at any time, by the way. There's a, ju- there's a ref, right. right? And then there's someone judging you. So, so you can find truth, beauty, and goodness in all aspects of life. Football, um, hip-hop, which with Jim, you know, I never thought I would be remotely interested in hip-hop, ever. But the more I hear it and the more I ta- and he talks about it and the more I'm understanding it, truth, there's truth to it, there's beauty in it. There's goodness in it. It's somebody's story. So here's the funny thing you should say that. So um, there's a guy named Edward O. Wilson. He wrote a book in 1998 called Consilience. And he said at some point he was quoted as saying that in the early stages of creation of both art and science, everything in the mind is a story. It all starts with a story. So now that brings me into my Ph.D. work. So my PhD work, I did interpretive phenomenological analysis, which you played a big role in that as well. So how do people make sense of and assign meaning to their experiences? That's what my doctoral work was really about. How do people make sense, particularly things that come at them from left field that they don't expect? So a lot of what I've done my whole life, and including what we're going to do on the podcast, is I'm very interested in looking and examining these things from different areas, particularly things I don't think I would be interested in. Now, it's funny. You're like one, like my oldest friend, one yeah. of my best friends, and football's pretty much been your life. From the time you played it in high school, you played college, mm-hmm. you went on to play some pro ball, and I don't give two shits about football, right? <laughs> right. It, until you talk about it, and then I'm fascinated, and then I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. If you ask me about hip-hop, I'm like, what do I care about hip-hop? Until I hear Jim talk about it. And then I'm like, man, you know, this it's is fair. part of our story. Yeah, we'll sit yeah. here while we're setting all this up. And sometimes we'll go, we'll carry on for an hour or two about how it got started and what it was about. And, you know, these guys didn't have access to normal um, instruments, right? So they had to use what they had. And it was about reflecting their, their reality, their reality, what they were going through. And that there was different assets. It's fast. It's endlessly. But it all brings me back to this idea of what's true. What's good and, and what's aesthetic? What's aesthetic? And who gets to decide it? I'm the question guy. I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by questions. 
I don't, you know, they say seek the man, you know, seek the man who is striving for truth or looking for truth and avoid the man who's found it. Because once you find it, yeah. you probably don't have it, right? Because once you but, answer yeah. it, the door shut. Now but you're convinced only... you have it, which is actually even worse. You're convinced you have it. Yeah, you're convinced you got it, so you don't need any more help. And, yeah. and then it go, doesn't go there. So let's talk about the PhD for a minute. So I, I get down, hmm. I do the doctoral work, and as it turns out, it's a long story made short. England, the way England, the way the English PhD system is set up is a lot different than most every place else. It comes down at the end of the day when you're finished writing what they call a uh, thesis. It's a doctoral thesis. Here in this country, we'd call it a dissertation. Dis at a master's level, it would be called a thesis, but they, they, it's inverted over there. Um, they'll say it comes down to two people at the end of the day who's never met you, supposedly. An internal examiner, which is a doctor from your university, and an external examiner from another university within the United Kingdom. There's about 120 universities in the, in the UK. So these people have complete and utter judgment over you. There is no appeal to their academic decision at all. Well, that is completely uh, antithetical to me as an American. There's always an appeal in our culture. If you feel you've been unjustly treated, there will always be some place to go and make your grievance, right? And it should be a whole panel of people. In this country, it is. It's your, it's your professors and your supervisor, along, right? right? There, <clears throat> two people you don't know. So without getting into really incriminating details about it, I was turned down the first time I went over there and told you have to rewrite the thing. We want a massive rewrite which took me an additional year. And then they refused to give me the second, uh, it's called a viva voce, in the live voice. You have to do the defense. And wouldn't even allow me to have it. They just said, no, no matter what you do, you're le your master's level, uh, and that's it. You cannot, you'll never get it. And that's the end of it. And <laughs> now what? Well, the only choice I had is I could appeal it, not based on their academic decision, but I said that they basically mistreated me in terms of breaking protocol. Like as an example, when I walked in, the, the woman who was, who was originally there was from Oxford, and she said, your work was unethical. That's the first thing out of her mouth. And I said, well, it went through a full vetting procedure. It w went through the, the, the uh, ethics board, and I was granted. <laughs> you don't get to tell me now right. that the whole thing's over with, that it's unethical. That was a br breach of protocol. Because you can't do it. How can you tell somebody right from the start? It's, your work, by the way, was unethical. But now we've gotten that out of the way. Let's have an honest discussion about it. Yeah, there's no way you're passing. Great. There's no way. Right. And in there's... fact, you shouldn't have even have been allowed to do the work. And you know what she objected with? That I interviewed my own patients. Because they were very that. concerned about power. And I might have un some undue influence upon these people. And that was unethical. Because I had a, there was a power discrepancy in the relationship. Now, I viewed it as I was giving people a voice that never would have had a voice. Right? That's right. how I viewed it. Now, I still have people that come to me all these years later who refuse to, to participate in that. They didn't want to. And I said, no problem. There's, no, there's not going to be any penalty. It's there if you want. If you don't want, no problem. Well, they viewed that. It, that's what they said. It was a, my whole work was unethical. Simply because now ethics is a big deal in research, particularly where I was going to school. It ha because of things like you, you'll hear about it now the the whole Nuremberg uh, protocols that, that was set up after Nazi Germany to make sure that people have full informed consent. There's no undue influence. Now compare that today. What's happening today, where people are being forced, absolutely forced to get a vaccine. They're forced to do this. They'll be fired from their jobs. They're being I mean, that's, let me tell you, from a research perspective, what they put me through for something to interview people compared to what's going to, it's really, it's really something. I have to say, it's really amazing to me. So that's a whole other thing. But the long and the short of it was, I appealed it, and I won the appeal, which is like unheard of. Even my professor said, nobody wins the appeal. So then I win the appeal, and now I'm going to get two new examiners, and I forget how many months it was going to be, but I asked him, can I continue to work on this? Yes, no problem. You can continue to work until you hand it. That's where you come in. Right. So then you and I would get together like, I don't know, two, three times a week at night. And I went through the entire, what I'll call the dissertation, because we're in America. 
And you remember that? And you, yeah. And we would go through that whole process. Yeah, we started. I basically said, start at the very beginning. Explain it to me in your words, right? Like, explain it to me. And you would read it, and I was like, I have no idea what you're reading here. Well, what it means is, and then you started to record that, and kind of just made some tweaks in the way you wrote it. Yeah, and we yeah, went page say, for page I for page. You, I remember you'd say, well, you need a le- you need a sentence that leads into this next thing. Because yeah, I'm like not- the way you spoke it <clears throat> was different. totally clear and yeah. transparent, right? And so the way you spoke it was more clear to me than the way you wrote it. And I said, well, maybe they don't even understand what you're trying to say, so let's just say it. And you recorded all of it. And that was a tough thing, too, because I had learned how to write English. Not right. British remember, English. Yeah. English. Right? Yeah, I remember that? Yeah, because I said so. No, we are English. Well, yeah. I asked the professor at one of the early on, I said, so I have to write it in, in British English, and they went English. The only English. Yeah, there's English. <laughs> so I, I had to write, everything had to be written in that, in that convention, spellings, grammatical, all of it. And the only time I didn't, I would write it in what would be called the American vernacular, was if I was giving a direct quote. Right? right? So that was a whole nother thing I had to learn. And I think and the one thing, <clears throat> the one thing that sticks out in my mind that maybe the people watching aren't don't understand is the volume of all of this, oh, yeah. the number of years, and then how big the paper was and the research. Oh yeah, the dissertation was almost five hundred pages. Or yeah. I forget, and I I have it with five hundred resources. And you know, now back in those days when I was doing that, I wasn't even allowed to to quote from a textbook because they said, well, you're taking the author's interpretation of that study. He, he talked about, even a medical textbook didn't count. I always had to go back into primary research and find the paper, and then I had to vet the paper, not the author's conclusions on it, not the abstract. I had to go through the whole thing and make sure and had to argue for the validity of each and every source that I looked at. So what that did is it taught me to question everything. And I remember going in a few times to, like, Helen Lethard. She, was, she had just obtained her full, full professorial appointment, which is really tough, especially for a woman in those days. It was hard, and she did it, and she was scary smart, brilliant woman, but she would read some of the things I would write. Like, for example, one of the things I based my work on was the Wilbur model, four-quadrant model. Yeah. And she would say, surely someone disagrees with Mr. Wilbur. Well, I don't know. Why, what, why would I care? I'm using his model to, dump. you have to go find, and you have to, they would always say you have to uh, engage, you have to engage fully with the literature, which meant not just the literature that supported your opinions, but everybody else who disagreed with it. And you have to argue against their argument, not from a passionate standpoint. They would always say as the, as the argument weakens, the voice strengthens, right? So if you're yelling at me, to get you, if you have to use emotion, if you have to emote, it, you're not ready for doctoral level work. And the other funny thing was a PhD in that, at that time, because I did it at Lancaster University, St. Martin's College, um, it was not about teaching you a damn thing. The PhD program wasn't a teaching degree, it was a red degree. So it was an opportunity for you to demonstrate your ability to do doctoral level work. It wasn't there to teach you anything. There was no required classes, there was no nothing to be graded, although we went to lectures all the time. And the, the thing was, is you were there to demonstrate your ability to do doctoral level work. If you had a weakness, you better fix that weakness. If you needed a class, you better go take the class. If you had a weakness, you better attend a lecture. So it was a very self-governed so type of a thing. It was your ticket to begin the journey. Yeah. And it wasn't you, the end of the no, journey. No, and in fact, you started off as, a, as what's called... Um, an MPhil, their master levels over there is considered a master philosophy. In their world, they consider that equal to one of our PhDs. <laughs> okay, yeah, they don't feel that we have anything equal to their PhDs over there. What what and was that's it, hotly contested? What was it about the the British model of education that you wanted to go that way? Uh, it was just more or less blind luck. I had a date with this girl, <laughs> and I was waiting for her, and she was. Uh, I picked up a magazine, a yoga magazine, while I was waiting for it, and it had a little ad in it for the Learning Collaborative, which was in, um, I think it was in uh, Milford, Connecticut, and it was the gateway, it was the portal into the British PhD program. And I had wanted to get a PhD because I had lectured, I had taught clinical neurology for like eight years, 
And I knew in that world, in the academic world, the, the degree is the doctor, the PhD, not even medical degrees. Medical doctors are, to an academic, a medical doctor is an honorary doctorate <laughs> because they've been trained. You get a PhD for creating knowledge. You have to make a, a, an original and significant contribution to knowledge. Well, you don't do that as a, as a clinician, right? You're not there to do that as a clinician. You're not doing that as a master level. You're there to understand the body of work and then to teach it or to, or to, or to do whatever it is you're doing. My idea was, and this was another thing, Terry, it was a challenge all the time because I never felt good enough, ever. So once I got this goal, then I'd be good enough. And, of course, once I got it, I devalued it. Groucho Marx said, I'll never, have, I'll never belong to a club that would have me as a member because it couldn't be worth shit if, it, if I got in. That's how I did every single thing in my life. I always devalued it, right? So the thought was if I could get a PhD from a, from a British university, then, yes, then I would finally know I was worth It's like Rocky when he said, if I could go the distance, then I'll know for the first time in my life that I'm not just a bum from the neighborhood. I'm somebody. That was my goal. And, and the way I found it was just, just by luck. So then I knew a fr uh, my buddy, actually, um, his mother, he's from Connecticut, and his mom didn't live too far from there. So he, he and I drove out, and we found the place. And I met him and talked to everybody. And then I had to write a six-page paper, which was my application to get into the doctoral program. And that's how I got hooked up with Mary Lou Edwards, yeah. which was a good friend of yours, an English teacher. Yes. And she... Uh, she took out her little red pen like a samurai sword and just started slashing through and yelling at me. And yeah. this is bullshit. Six Get pages, rid of this, right? Six pages, to, but down to one. Now you got to start over And again. she would take things out that was important. And I'd say, you can't take that out. That's bullshit, she'd say. It's not. Well, then, you got, then if it isn't, then you need to be able to say it clearly because this is bullshit, right? Brutal. Yes. But at the end... I had a really good paper. Then I had to fly to England, and I had to find a professor that would be willing to take me on as a as a student. So I found Dr. Diane Cox, and I was oh, yeah, her yeah. first I was her first PhD student actually that she ever took on. Well, that's how it all happened. That's how it all happened. Well, I ask that because throughout these podcasts, your viewers are going to see you've always taken the road less traveled. Yeah. Like, look at just in our few minutes. I know and you don't like to talk about yourself, but. You decide to get into weightlifting as a teenager, and you're suddenly in the national championships. And you go to college to be chiropractic college, and you run into the Gracies in martial arts. Like, and so, you know, you want to get a PhD? Yeah, I think I'll go to Britain and do it. And yeah. one of the things that's been so unique and, and, you know, a blessing as your friend is your journey to always try to get better. You know, and whatever path it might be, and then the, you know, here you sit with mm. this knowledge that I appreciate at least. So, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I think that's because I've always, uh, I've avoided being um, part of whatever mainstream is. <laughs> Sorry about that. You can edit that. <laughs> we'll leave it in. I, god damn it. <laughs> we'll leave it in. But no, that's, so that, that's another thing is, and once things became mainstream, I lost interest. Like now grappling, everybody does grappling. If right? everybody can do it, yeah, it's I, not it's your... Not, I don't have an interest in it. That's why I've always been attracted to things outside the uh, mainstream, whatever it is. And, and I'm always curious about what is it about that. Part of it's because I don't like to be told what to do. I don't want to fit in to, your, to what you think I should be. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's been a detriment to me. Had I been able to play the game a little better, my life would have been a lot easier. I mean, I go into a profession that was an outlaw profession. When I went in, I got into chiropractic 30 years ago. Oh, my God. I mean, you guys are quacks and witch doctors. And it was. And in those days, you couldn't even come see me if you didn't get a prescription from your medical doctor. Of course, they're not giving you one. And, I, I mean, I dealt with constant... Um, <laughs> my buddy Donnie, who's like my oldest friend from my chiropractic days, said to me, well, now you know what it feels like to be black. <laughs> That's yeah. what he said to me, right? He goes, because now, no matter what, the first thing they see is that chiropractic thing. Not if you're smart, not if you're capable. You're automatically written off, period, right? Well, that was, there was a lot of truth to that. 
So it wasn't the, quite the same thing, but he said, you understand, it's, it's a hard thing to defend because they won't even give you the chance. But I never gave up, and I never, I never allowed someone to label me. It was like I continued to push through and push through and push through. But yeah, I didn't go into a normal, every, like, you know, I didn't go into what would can be considered mainstream anything, ever. And once it becomes mainstream, I'm losing interest. I'm losing interest. Like, well, usually because you visited it first. I went there first. You've been got, there already. Well, getting back to the weight room. That wasn't mainstream when you and I were doing it. Now it is. Everybody does it. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, they moved the weight room up two stories at the Y. Yeah. We, right. were, we were in the dungeon. We were in the basement, right. <laughs> we are in the basement. And that was good. And, and where did I go to grapple? In the basement, in the ba- <laughs> which was in the bottom of this little restaurant. The restaurant was like this high-end, high-scale place in St. Louis. And to get to the grappling school, you had to go in the back alley through this little door all the way down. And I'm like, what the hell is this? It was another portal. So I found, I found these portals in my life. I'm attracted to those, and I feel, I feel at home there. I don't feel, even to this day, I don't feel that at home with mainstream type of, like if I have to go to a dinner or I have to give a talk somewhere, or whatever, and it's all the mainstream, I'm like, these aren't really my people. Let's go down that alley. Those right. guys. I'll, to the heart of America. That's, go of, yeah. into, that's why when Jim and I were talking about the hip-hop and he'd go into, was it the Bronx or Brooklyn, right? He'd go in those, and I'm like, yeah, at, I get that. I'd do the same thing. You know what I mean? Let's go find out what that, because I think my attitude is when you get too mainstream, you, you're not finding the truth, you're not finding the goodness, and you're not finding the beauty. You're finding bullshit, basically. Now, I'll admit that's my own <laughs> that's my own thing, okay? That's my I'm putting that on that. Right. But I just feel like as soon as something as soon as it becomes mainstream, in order for to it to be mainstream, we had to lose something. We had to give up some authenticity to it. And I don't know if that's true or not true, but it's that's how I've always felt and I think that's why I've always tried to find So, getting back to like why why we're going to do this. This whole podcast thing came about because <laughs> I've been in practice now for like 25 years, right? So many people will say to me, man, you should do a podcast. You should. I like coming in and like talking to you. I enjoy talking, right? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't have an, I have really a hard time with just staring at a camera and talking, and that's a hard thing for me. But having a dialogue is a, is a fun thing. I'm, I've been super excited about it. Uh, being a friend of yours for so long, all the in-depth conversations, whether it's just you and I or yeah. our grappling club or our group of friends, Great conversations. Uh, you have great insight to things. Been a real so going back. So what? What's you, can, you got any uh, memories of like early on in the, or any time during the grappling? Is there anything? That, is there any memories that stick out above others that for you that you recall? Yeah. You know, to start. So you you go in there. You're 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 leaving your re- real world, work, college, family, whatever you got. You step into the dojo our little building there and you're changing your gear and it's almost like a transformation and you're putting on your stuff and you get out on the mat and sometimes even when you step on there you're still in the outside like you're still right and I can remember and especially if you're going through some hard parts of your life you know and so you come in there and we'd be grappling or whatever we'd be doing and uh maybe you weren't there, like, like your mind wasn't there, you weren't functioning right, and you had such a pulse on all of your guys that you knew it, right, and, uh, you know, you used to say to us a lot, who do you fight, and so if you were blanked out, not doing something, you would always ask, you know, where are you at, who do you fight right now, and I remember that a lot, mm-hmm. and I also remember at the end of our sessions, you had I wish, wish we had a picture of this, Cold, you know, 40 degrees or 90 degrees, but we're all kneeled down, sweat everywhere, steam coming off us, looking at those boards, barely being able to breathe to the brink of exhaustion. And now I got to dig into my soul Mm. to figure out what is important to me. Those memories, those moments, uh, you'll never forget. And it's really, really taught me a lot in my professional as a coach and as a teacher. You know, I found out you're coming out to the football field and you have one of your players that you can tell they're struggling. First of all, you taught me as a leader to look for those things. Mm. So a kid's struggling and you might say to him, hey, what's up? 
you're getting nothing on the way to practice. They're fighting whatever they're fighting, whether it's home, school, girlfriend. The time was after when you're dirty, muddy, exhausted. Now you're coming in, you throw your arm on them and go, hey, what's up? I learned all that from our club. I learned when I went through difficult times in my life, rather than reverting to drinking or losing my anger, it was how to stay in control, right? That emotional, don't get too high and don't get too low, but just be able to maintain. Right. Um, used to tell us a lot, um, our emotions were like the weather. Sometimes you can't control them. You just have to notice they're there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are going to watch this and even understand how powerful that is. When you're having a feeling, when you're, whether it's real high or really low, and you're, like for me, an A personality who wants to grab that feeling and get rid of it if I don't like it, but the more I fight it, the worse it gets. Mm. To be able to just go, it's just the weather. It's a storm. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm going to watch it go by. Recognize it's there. Don't ignore it, but don't even try to change it. Mm -hmm. But the discipline you need to do that, and that's where the grappling, the weight training, that discipline comes not in that conversation, but when you're laying on that mat, stuck in a position that you can't move, mm -hmm. and quitting is not an option because they're not getting off you. <laughs> right? Quit, then you're going to go unconscious. So you had to fight. Mm. And when you took that physical part, into the emotional part and combine them priceless, like mm. priceless. I, I hope some of these podcasts will get into some of those conversations about the gym. Um, yeah, that's, that's my, well, so one of the things we've talked about in the past too was, you know, we've played around with having like a, a like a men's club kind of thing where yeah. men and what, what is it that men face that's unique to them? I got two little boys, right? And I'm trying to raise them. And now, even the idea of being a man, what does it mean? And toxic masculinity, like what does that really mean? What does that say? Should you feel badly about the fact you were born male? And are you born male? Is that even a thing? Or is that a, is that a social constructed kind of a thing? And how do you become, you know, for me, I've always tried to walk the warrior's path. And, the, and a warrior is not somebody who's a barbarian who just is a violent, nasty person. It, all, it always has to do with this idea, like the, the code of the Bushido, you know, where I have an obligation to my friends, to my family, to my community. I have an obligation to conduct myself in a certain way. I mean, that to me transcends even the word manhood or womanhood or maybe yeah. it's personhood, right? Like, I don't want to be a, a slave to the rich man and I don't want to be a burden to the poor man. So I want to be able to do the best I can, not just in financial or whatever, but if somebody needs something, you know, am I able to help you? Am I able to do something to help you? If you need, you know, am I, do I have the courage to stand up for what's right? When the whole world is putting pressure on you and saying, no, do you cave into that so that you don't feel uncomfortable? And if I think it's right, isn't that enough? Yeah, well, is it? Or should yeah. we have to question it and say, am I wrong? I think it's value in questioning it, but once you've questioned it and you're convinced, then you have to stand on your convictions. You have to. Right. And if you don't, then you're lost, forever lost. You, you'll never know who you are as a human being that way. You know? And I don't like, I really don't like bullies. Like, I don't like to be bullied in any way, shape, or form because that is, is devaluing me as a human being. It's saying I don't count, and it's saying you will do, you'll do this or else. And I'm the kind of person that don't, I don't respond to all of that. And I don't think most people, I think it's very life, uh, it's a, it kills the living spirit in people. When they've, when they've been bullied to the point where they no longer know who they are, they can't stand up for themselves anymore. And then the worst thing that can happen is you start to bully yourself into it. It starts becoming this self-fulfilled, you see what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's a very unhealthy thing for people. And it's like, I don't need to make, I don't need to make, for me to feel good about myself, I don't need to make you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. You know, and that's the whole thing. And run your race. Never mind the other guy. Never mind what he's doing. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be somebody who's better, faster, stronger, bigger, more successful and whatever. I know, I think it was Denzel Washington who said once, people 
who you're never going to be criticized by someone doing more than you. You're only going to be criticized by doing from someone who's doing less than you. If you're being criti- if somebody's one of these people that are constantly throwing the critic, that's a problem inside themselves. Right, right. It's like the old vision. You have the ladder. You have the person on top and the person on the bottom. The person on the bottom's character is going to be, be defined by what they do. Are they going to work harder to get up next to you on the ladder, or are they going to reach up and pull Try you pull off you the down. ladder? Right. How are they going to get in front of you? One of two ways. Right. When I was training with Rodrigo Vaghi, I was in his first class. When he first came over from Brazil, and he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think he's under Hoyler Gracie, same as Steve. And he came over, and I was he didn't even have a school at the time. And I was training in his basement with him. And it was brutal, hard. And I'd get so frustrated sometimes. And he'd say to me, training's the only answer. Training's the only answer, right? That's in your, in your weight room. Yeah, I put it on the board. That's, and yeah. I put it in my weight room, right? Because at the end of the day, if you have something that you lack, that guy's better than you. He's got better whatever. The only solution is for you to put your work in and work harder. Right. What how you used to say, feet on the mat and time on the water. Yeah, right. All those same concepts, right? Well, time on the water, right. You got two guys fishing. They're both using the same tackle, the same boat. One guy's catching fish, the other guy isn't. Why is that? Well, he's got time on the water. He's got so much time invested. He's doing a million little things that you don't even realize, and he may not even realize he's doing. So here's a little insert on where the mat helps with that. Because we were all dads, professionals, our club wasn't just professional no professional fighter well one yeah didn't Gosh. even but didn't start that no. way to be that way no, he was a, we were right. all just men and even women right women too yeah right and so what because of that there would be times where you would train months on end and then something would get in the way and then you might miss not only once but a month of time like whatever little league baseball for me mm-hmm. my kids would and next thing you know it'd be a month now you've been training all these years you take a month off, you come back, and all those guys that had less time than you but hadn't stopped training, right. they were gaining. Yeah. And then you would be frustrated, like you'd be mad at yourself and frustrated, and, mm-hmm. and you would just go, you got to keep your feet on the mat. You're right. not here. Right. You know, and we would voice it. We were pretty, oh, like, God darn it. And you'd be like, time on the water. Yeah. You haven't put your time. That time. is reality. Right. And so now fast forward that into being a dad and a husband and got to keep your, your, your feet on the mat. You yeah. got to take care of your kids. You got, if you don't, you lose control of the outcome. Now, arguably, do we have control of any outcome? Right. But at least it gives us a fighting chance to have control yeah. of the outcome. Well, you do have control of your reaction to things. Yeah. I don't have control over anybody else, anything else, what goes on, but I got control over how I react to it. Right. I have some control over that, my response to it. So if I choose to fall into victimhood and fall into this idea that how unfair life is and everybody's picking on me and that guy screwed me and blah, 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 it's all true. It's all true. But my question is, does that empower you? Right? Right. It doesn't empower you. Remember, we used to say, keep your soul in the room, right? Yeah. And I said to the one guy, (laughs) the one kid showed up, just, you know, exhausted from the first training. I said, you know, you have to keep your soul in the room. Do you know what that means? He goes, your fighting spirit? I said, no, the soles of your feet. <laughs> right, it was that blunt. It was that yeah. blunt. You got to keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. It's the only answer. It's the, the only, only answer one. because there is, you know, I used to, I've been a failed musician for years and years and years and years. And I used to think some people were just blessed with it. And I do think there are people with musical talent, right? Like, Way more than I ever had. I had, I come, I don't come from musical talent. I come from no talent, zero talent. So February 6th this year will be three years I haven't missed practicing the guitar. Not a single day. Through COVID, through flu, through colds, through whatever. Not missed. Because I made a commitment, I'm going to do it every, and I'm a whole lot better than I used to be. And I understand it a whole lot better. But it came down to putting my time in because I realized people who are good at anything, musicians, whatever, they put a lot of time in, man. No matter what your, what your natural ability may be or not be. What I was doing is I fell into victimhood and I said, well, it's, I just wasn't born with this talent. I just suck and that's just the way it is and how unfair the world is. 
Meanwhile, there's this kid over here who's kicking my ass at it. But guess what he does? He sits in his bedroom for eight hours a day and yeah. plays. Now, I don't have eight hours a day, right? I've got a family. I run businesses. I've, but I get up every morning, and it's a ritual for me. And the truth is, most of the time, I don't enjoy it. In fact, a lot of times, I really don't like it. Like I, and I've wanted to quit a million times. The only difference was I made the decision not to quit this time. And I said, in five years, I'm going to change my life. Well, I'm coming up on three years. Two more years? Now, will I ever get there? No. But the point is, I no longer feel like a failure at it because I've put so much time and dedicate. I also found the best teacher I could find and did 16 months of private lessons with him. It's a silly thing. Now, people say, well, one guy said, uh, are you going to play out? I said, no. I meant, well, I don't see the point of it. Oh. So you don't see the point of it unless you're, being, you're, you're getting some kind of external validation. My, own, my medical doctor said to me one day, so you play every day because you enjoy it. Like, I said, no, I hate it. I don't get it. Why would you do it? I said, because I like having done it. It's the reward. There's a famous author. I forget her name, but she said, I hate writing, but I love having written. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Now, how many times did you go down and not want to grapple? Right. How many times have you walked in the weight room and not wanted to do it? How many times have you gone to football practice and like, I, I want to be anywhere but here? Right. You do it because you make a dedication to it. You dedicate. That's what the code of the Bushido is really about. It's I don't live my life according to my emotions because my emotions change constantly. Also, you might be able to invoke an emotion in me I don't like. Well, now I'm no longer at the I'm no longer at the at the cause of my life. I'm at the effect of my life. There's another yeah. right, and I'm being I'm being affected by everybody, constantly. All somebody has to do is look at me funny or. I don't get the job I want or something changes in my life and now what? My whole world's upside down. So the whole idea of that discipline to the study, to the principles, no matter what's going on around me, no matter how unfair the world is, I come back to that center and I keep centering myself on that discipline. Now you have to realize, of course, now I'm getting older, I can't physically do what I used to do, right? So what did I do? I still train. I've been training with Chris and, and Anthony, more, now pretty much just with Chris up in uh, Rochester. Hopefully you have those guys on. That was another dedication you made, remember? Yeah. They're in Rochester in so, two years, you said, right? You were going to do two I said, I'm going to go train every two weeks for two years. Two years. You made a commitment. And now it's been, this summer will be six years I've been doing it. Yeah. Right? Commit. Now, you know the number of times I took off and did not want to drive that three hours? <sighs> Didn't matter. I made a commitment to it. And I keep committing, keep committing, keep committing, keep committing. Um, Which is an interesting, I mean, you ever look at people that are really good at something? Some pe I don't even know where to go with this. You look at somebody, I can't believe they've accomplished this, 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 and this. And whether you're jealous or respectful of it, but you have no idea what they did to get there. Mm -hmm. That's what I think about like when you tell somebody stories. Mm -hmm. How long the PhD took? Oh, just drive to Rochester Almost for ten years. Yeah, right. said to, and then drive to Rochester for six years. Right. So don't you know? Well, it would have been easy for me to have the excuses too. Right. And nobody would disagree with me. Man, I would love to train Kali, but listen, <laughs> they're three hours away. I, 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 I'm a father. I'm a husband. I run a practice. You know, I, I have to do these. I mean. When am I going to find it? And everybody would agree. And I, if I wanted to, I could get around a whole group of people that would all echo that back to me about how unfair the world was. And how I would get up, and I just did again. Now that Chris, him and I are pretty tight, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the guy. He'll come here. He right. drove down the other night to train with me, right? So, but the point being, you'll do it if it's worth it to you. Right. You'll make time for what's important. You will. And, and excuses for what's not. Yeah, and you know, it, I don't want to give people like the idea like this is some magic thing where I don't struggle or I don't. I struggle constantly. I struggle in every aspect of my life. In fact, everything I've ever done has been hard. That's another bunch of baloney that I've run into a lot of people that will to try to make themselves look better. They'll talk about how easy it was. Nothing has been easy for me. And when I tell you nothing, nothing. I got out of high school, went to college, one semester dropped out, quit. Then I went in to, I did two years of apprenticeship training in heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You know what that was? Making duck work in a sweatshop. Never hated a job that much in my life. 
it was hard, really hard. Then I got into the electrical, and I did four years of apprenticeship training, and it was hard. So what did I do? I found the smartest guy that I could find. His name was Jimmy McIntyre. Jimmy was a smart guy, way smarter than me in terms of the electrical, what he knew. He already had a degree in it. I went to his house, and he tutored me. See, that's the big difference between me and a lot of people. Instead of me sitting back and bitching and moaning and pointing a finger at this guy and saying, well, he's got that and it's easy. No, no, no. I go, I'll learn from you. Right. Right. So that's what I did. Four years of apprenticeship. It was hard, man. Then I got my master's license, became a, ma- started a company, did that for three years. That was hard. Kept taking classes at night at JCC. Hard. Nothing was easy for me. I get, I finally get into chiropractic college. Hard as hell. Not easy. I have a terrible memory. I can't remember anything. So I have to go through it. I feel like what other people can pay $5 for, I got to pay $500 for. Does that make sense? Not yeah. in money, but in resources, in effort. Time, yeah. Time, effort. But that's how it's always been for me, you know? And So don't you dare look on the outside and go, <laughs> it's all easy. If you can do it, it must have been easy. Right. Well, you've got all this because you're yeah, this You're guy. talented. I'm you're... like, no, I... I bled more than you. I sweated more than you. And the truth is, there are people who are working harder than me. I've got a friend of mine who owns a contracting business. And he makes a lot of money, okay? And he has a lot of success. Dude, I don't begrudge him any of it because I wouldn't be willing to do that. He, he puts so many hours in and so much time. And I'm like, God, hey, you're, ha- you're welcome. Take the average CEO. 80-hour, 100-hour weeks these guys work. I'm not willing to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't begrudge medical doctors. They're they're on call sometimes. Some of the hours they put in, holy crap. I don't have any. And the the truth is there are people born with a silver spoon right up their ass. That's how it is. I can't be concerned with that either. That's not my journey. That's not my path. Remember when we used to get in with the discussions about do you want to be really, really great at one thing? or well-rounded and good at a lot of them. And I don't know that we ever come up to an answer with that, but... That's a hard one for me. Isn't it? It's a hard one because, look, I went into chiropractic, and I said, I'm not going to be the guy who does acupuncture, chiropractic, Reiki, uh, you know, nutritional counseling. I'm going to do one thing, chiropractic. And I use my hands. I use my mind, and I use my hands. And that's all I've done. That's the Harvard Business School model, which is be the very best at one thing. That's what I've tried to do. But because I'm wired to be so interested in so many things, but here's what I had to learn. I had to learn that I could still pursue things and not. I had to be the best I could be. I didn't have to worry about being the best in the world. Right. Look, I'm never going to be the best guitar player, never. It's just not, it wasn't my dharma, you know what I mean? It wasn't my calling in life. But I can be always better than I was. A little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. I'm never going to be, I tell people I'm the best in the world at what I do chiropractically. What is that that you do? I don't know. But I know I'm the best in the world at what I do. Because it's, I have to be, I'm the guy doing it. And as long as it's true to me, you can't do, you can't be me. Right. You got to be you. Does that make sense? Right. Well, you're your own toughest critic anyway. And I think for people that are successful, that's a true statement for a lot. Yeah. yeah it's in, right? You're I've, self-driven and your own worst So I want to say this before, before we make sure we don't forget about this. So I go into the PhD world. It took me almost 10 years to get that doctorate. Now, the way it works is a full-time PhD is three years with one additional year to write. So most people can take four years. If you do it part-time, it's six years with an additional year. So seven years is not uncommon because you got to have a year to write on top of whatever. Yeah, and wor- if you're part-time, you're working. You're working, so it takes a long time. I, it took me nearly 10 years, partly because I had to intercolate, they call it. I had to take br- breaks because I had health issues. I had surgeries. I couldn't work. I tore my knees up. I tore, I tore all the muscles off both my legs, and I had to have my legs reconstructed surgically, right? Still went back and grappled, still went on, right? <laughs> There's a funny story about that, too, when you picked me up the one time, because I was in a cast. Remember that story? I was trying to be a friend. Yeah. He's a friend. He's going to take me out, get me out of the house, and I got all my weight, and I'm trying to get my leg wouldn't bend, and I got all my weight on the, on the seat in your van, and you released it, to, and it went back. I was trying to give you some room. Yeah, <laughs> and it, like, bent my knee. 
and I'm screaming. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, life comes up. So life right. comes up, and it takes so it's like ten years, right? So I go and I and now at the very end of it, somebody says to me, "You're not good enough, and no matter what you do, you'll never be good enough." Oh, and by the way, you have no power, zero. And this guy all the time was concerned with power. That that's what he. That's what he, uh, he, he pretended that was his thing, right? He's so concerned with people that are marginalized. and he's so, But boy, did he love wielding power over me. Right. He loved it, right? So then I go from no matter what you do, you're never going to be good enough to the very, when you went with me, you went to England with yes. me to defend that doctorate. Yes. That's a whole other yes, that's, that could story, be a whole, right? Yeah. They thought the circus was in town. <laughs> and... I went in there, and I remember thinking to myself, I, I don't have any control over whether they give me the degree, but I want to walk out of that room knowing that I kicked its ass. Mm -hmm. That's, and I, if I can know that for myself, I don't care. You can keep your degree. I don't, I'm not, I don't need your valid. And what's the guy say to me? He goes, it was probably the finest work I, had, I have read published in, the, in that, in that uh, subject. And he wanted to work with me at that point. And it pissed me off because I realized at that point, it's just an opinion. Yeah. It's just 180 some, from the first yeah. opinion. So if I, if I, if I pay attention, if I don't pay attention to the first opinion, how can I pay attention? to the, So that, that was a transformational change in my life. It told me, and, and at that point I stopped goal seeking at that point. I never did another because finally I got to the point where I realized you have to know this for yourself. You cannot seek validation outside yourself because you'll never find it. All you're going to do is be victimized by somebody's opinion about you. Another grappling principle. And if, and if you allow, allow that to happen, they can take that from you then, can't they? Yeah. All I got to do is decide you're not good enough now. It's on our wall, right? Don't seek yourself outside Don't yourself. Don't seek yourself outside yourself. If you do, it's on a fool's errand. You're never going to find yourself by seeking yourself through somebody else's validation, right? And I walked out of that, P and dude, I knew I nailed it. I knew I remember, it. remember, yeah. Remember, you were waiting for me. Yes. And I walked out. Which and seemed like forever. And were like, how'd it go? And I went, yeah, I got it. Now, I didn't know they were going to give me the degree or not give me the degree, right? They could but have you chosen. accomplished your goal. I did. And, and I remember saying to this one woman who was a patient of mine, she said, look, since you don't have control over whether they're going to give you the degree, how do you want to feel on the flight home? Well, I thought, I don't like flying anyway. That's a whole other thing. I was going right? to say, that's... We don't me, like flying. You, you made or me. me laugh. Yeah. You or me. <laughs> but I wanted to feel content. Like, I wanted to feel, yeah. yes, I've achieved this thing. I've proven it to myself, and they know too, whether or not I got the degree, right? And there was. You had a sense of peace over you. I we didn't it. do any... It was all business when we got there. Yeah. Remember? And right now, so you arrive, you get there. We didn't really do much sightseeing. I remember you had your suit, your jacket... And you were what we were walking up that hill. Bishop it was hotter hill. than blazes. Bishop's hill, they called it. Yeah, remember that. University, yeah. But really, it was all business. Mm -hmm. It was like going to a powerlifting meet, right? Yeah, right, or a grappling tournament. It yeah. was, and then the sense of peace over you afterwards is when we yeah. kind of hit a couple restaurants and did a yeah. little shopping. You didn't. It didn't matter. You won the race. Yeah, and no and matter I, the outcome. I, no matter the outcome, and that's the thing. If right. I could tell anybody. You have to know for yourself that you gave it your absolute best. Yeah. And if you did, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, I tell my son all the time, you know, if you get in a race and you take dead last, but you've just, you just got a personal record, that's as good as it gets, buddy. It doesn't matter what the other guy did. You have no control. It's, that's not even your world. It's not your life. It's not, you're only competing against yourself. But that's a, it took me how many years to and how many goals and how many things to and so that many out? outside influences on that. It, it reminds me of the weight room, your own personal goal. The first time you put two big boy plates on and, and bench one thirty five, right. and then your next goal is two big boy plates yeah. two twenty five. You don't even need to be good in math if you're a weight room guy. It's it's one thirty five two and a quarter two and a quarter three fifteen four hundred five four ninety three. Right, you just know it. <laughs> you just do it. Yeah. And it's, you know, you push and push and you don't get it. But when you get help and racket, you're smiling. It's, you won. You, you fought the fight. Yeah. It's trying to, you know, you're wrestling, you're grappling somebody ranked better than you and he whips you every day. And this day, you didn't get tapped. You didn't even beat him. Right. But you didn't first don't lose. Right. And going, 
that was a win. That was a win. Right? right. And now maybe next time I'll try my first offensive move. Like, right. yeah, it's, it's well, all. Well, that's the thing is people, people get, let their ego run them to the point where they're not even aware of reality anymore. What good does it do? I mean, say you say you win it. Say say you were to, as an example, say you won a football game because the other team got a couple of really bad calls. Now you could be high fiving each other, and but you know in your heart of hearts, you didn't really win that game. Right. You won it because of a bad call. Yeah, you got away with one. Now yeah. you got away with one, and now you're all happy. But what happens when that wheel turns, and now you're the guy who gets the bad call? But let's say you went out and you actually played better. Your team played better than they'd ever played. They were outmatched, let's just say. But, man, they played great, and they lost the game. But that, to me, would be better than winning when – or say you beat somebody who was not even any competition for you. wasn't even fun. Doesn't yeah. that happen? Don't they – isn't that really, like, a problem sometimes when they run the score up sometimes? Yeah. Isn't that a problem? And they'll, they'll criticize the coach and say, yeah. hey, why would you do that? Why didn't you put some of your lesser players in? Let them – you knew you, you right, right. But yet, no, you kept your all stars in there just to run the. What's that about? Why are you doing that? It's all interesting. Ego, stuff. yeah, ego, ego. Not just the coach, maybe even the player, maybe even their parents. Oh, for sure, right? For sure. Don't take my kid out. They're going for the school record in points. Right. Don't matter. Yeah, yeah. It's that's so. Well, true. we've talked about redoing strength training and getting away from the heavy lifts and everything, and then all of a sudden, it's like parents get mad about it. No, my son's got to bench that 300 pounds or what. Well, your son bounces 300 pounds. He, right. He benches about 205. No, nope, no, nope, not my boy. My boy, bent, right? Does he? And what difference does it make? Does that equate to the athletic? Right. But we're so hung up on external. You know what I mean? You don't really squash that for me, and I won't even remember who it was. But a guy wins a, a NFL player wins a Super Bowl and he said it was the most depressing six months after the Super Bowl of his entire life mm. he had worked his entire life high school to go to college college to make it to the NFL and the NFL to be a Super Bowl champion and when he did then he was like now what where do I go? All right, we won the game. We had the confetti. We had the Super Bowl party. We got our gifts. We, I got my ring and now now I got to go back to camp. I got to do all this over again. Right. Like what he what he predicted he would feel like as a Super Bowl champion wasn't how he felt. Right. So immediately when I saw that, I'm like, see, your victory's got to be within. Mm -hmm. And they got to be small. Right? You, you can't set goals. And they tell you that when you go on a diet. Don't tell yourself you're going to lose 100 pounds. Just lose two pounds at a time. Mm-hmm. Right and reward yourself and respect the fact that you did that and your your happiness is internal. Mm -hmm. We've learned that a lot. I, I said, man, life's really simple. We just want to be happy. The complex part is how you figure all that out. That's every conversation you have. Right. We just want to be happy. Just don't know what that is. Well, one of the big things I learned was what makes me happy is this. Yeah. Conversations with people, my relationships with people. I realize anything else isn't really, it doesn't matter. Look, I could be a billionaire with a, with a $300 million yacht. If I had to be on that thing by myself, I would be depressed out of yeah. my mind. I mean, we started off talking about how, you know, we know somebody who likes to go to dinner by themselves or they go, <laughs> right? And I think that's cool. I think that's great. But for me, I'd be depressed. It's for me, my, my life is all about relationships with people. And here's the yeah. funny thing. Because I had kind of a, a rough childhood and, and uh, you know, I think most people who – the other thing I want to say about this is a lot of overachievers have had some – they're not the most well-balanced human beings you ever met. Some of them are trying to overcome whatever childhood trauma they've had, right? And I think that applies definitely to me. It applies to a lot yeah. of people. But what I, what I was going to say about that was what I found was – the only thing that's lasting that doesn't give me that anticlimactic crash is if I can help somebody else a little bit. It's the wounded healer th concept, right? The wounded he people who've been wounded go into positions like teaching, coaching, maybe into yeah. something like I'm doing, 
where you're trying to help somebody else in need who's hurt. Because when you help that person, you get helped too a little bit. Right. You get a little bit helped. You get a little bit. But, you know, in sports, you're only good as your last game. You're only as good as your last fight. You're only as good as – look at the guys who've been amazing fighters and they lose once, and all of a sudden they're bums. I'm <laughs> like, really? Right. You're going to take all that away from them. all their achievements. You're going to take away. Or then they start comparing you in different time periods. Well, he could, if he'd, he'd been around today, he couldn't have taken this guy. How do you, he wasn't around at that time. So I always loved, enjoyed, respected, whatever the word is, those fighters that <clears throat> when they win, they calmly say, today I was a better fighter. And when they lose, they calmly say, today he was a better that fighter. That was Fedor Emelianenko. Love it. I love it too. Not jumping, screaming, no. cutthroating no. in your face. No. Today, I was a better fighter. Yes. And I've even, I even like guys like Randy Couture one time. He, I think he fought one of the Naguera brothers. And he said, and he just got pounded. I mean, the guy whipped his ass. And he goes, all I can say is he was firing on all cylinders today, <laughs> right? And he was almost joyous about it. It was like, man, he whipped my ass. He was really good. I thought, wow, what a guy he is. Yeah. That, that's, but then you got a guy like uh, Conor McGregor where, you know, he breaks his leg. And he's making he's making derogatory remarks about the guy's wife and the guy really? Yeah. That see that doesn't now I don't take anything away from that dude. I, I respect a lot of what he's achieved and everything, but that's not for me. I, I like the guy who's very calm yeah. because you get the sense like he's not so attached to this outcome that it's gonna affect him. Either way it goes, you know what I mean? Either way it goes. I've always respected people that have inner control. Yeah, me too. They have a calmness about them that actually makes me calm. Right. So I've always had great respect because if you've even dipped into trying to calm yourself down, you can respect the amount of work that that, probably a lifetime. A lifetime of work. To feel that way. Right. So, yeah. One of the best, one of the favorite things I saw with Fedor was a guy was interviewing him and it was Boss Rutten. Boss Rutten, who I met and trained with, by the way. Yeah, you were telling me that. Well, that guy's something else, man, but... (laughs) <laughs> Boss said to him, who's your favorite fighters? Who do you like to fight? And Fedor goes, I don't really like, f- I don't like watching fighting. I don't like fighting. I don't. He goes, you're kidding. He goes, no, I don't really like it. He does it by a lot of people's standards. He's the best maybe he's to maybe ever the do best, it. Yeah. He's certainly one of them, right? But he's not defined by that. He travels with his priest. He's a family guy. It's his relationships with people and beyond that. You know, and one time I saw an interview with him where he said, everybody wants to fight me all the time. No one wants to go have dinner. <laughs> it's, I, yeah, it's, right? I actually saw that, yeah. Yeah, it's like nobody says, hey, you want to go have dinner? <laughs> sit, you know, talk. Um, that guy, for me, I have, I have huge respect for, man. That guy is just... Now, he's been beaten now a bunch of times, right? Guys have beat... But it's more than just his win-loss. It's the fact that he's in such control. And I, I think that is a great thing, man, when you, can, when you can get there. But here's the other thing. If you can't, and this is for me, I've always been the most critical of myself. I was on, Drew Perlman asked me to be on his podcast, and he asked me at the end, and I didn't know what he was going to say it. He goes, if you could go back 20 or 30 years, what advice would, give, would you give to your younger self? And I said something along the lines of, I would tell myself to be kinder to myself. Yeah. Because I was not kind to myself. Harsh is hell, right? And now I look back on it, and I'm like, whatever. I mean, here's the downside to that, though. You can find yourself unmotivated to do anything. I'm not goal-driven anymore. So it's hard for me to get excited about doing anything. So that's been a challenge. Yeah, a lifetime of critical, so critical to yourself, yeah. And finally, getting to the point where I went, I don't need anybody's uh, approval or... I don't, I don't care about it anymore. It just doesn't matter. Well, where do you go? What drives you forward? And the only thing I found was if you can make somebody else's life maybe a little better. That's the only thing I can come up with because I don't think money, of course, I've never had enough money to know. Mike Tyson said the other day on an interview I saw, he said, you think money is going to make you happy because you never had a lot of it. That's what he told this guy. You've never had a lot of money. That's why you think it'll make you happy. Well, he has had a lot of it, yeah. right? And he knows it didn't make him happy. So I'm pretty sure that's not going to make me happy. I'm pretty sure I could be as happy living in a little tiny... I lived in a trailer, okay? And I was just as happy as the house I live in now. 
It doesn't matter. That, that's just meaningless to me. It's the relationships, which is really why I'd finally decided, let's do a few podcasts and s- yeah. see what we can get. And I think I was interested in helping, number one, because you're such a great friend and taught me so much. But number two, if people watch it, just I think the beginning of healing starts with knowing you're not the only one. Mm. So just we throw out a lot of things. At least we're telling you you're not the only one. Right. Right? We all, you know, I don't know. It's so powerful and so healing to me to know it's okay if I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one divorced or I'm not the only one that lost a parent or I'm not. Struggling right? with a health issue. Yeah, it doesn't fix lost it. Lost your job or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it just yeah. makes me realize. And then other people that have been through it, it also tells me, and I will go on. Mm-hmm. This too shall pass. Right. What a powerful statement. It's not the end all be all. In the moment it might be. Mm. But if you can just get through it with the help of your friends and some self-control, like it will be okay. Mm -hmm. You used to tell me this too when I was going through some tough times and you would chat with me. It won't be just like it is. Right? It'll be different, Mm -hmm. but that'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Seems silly, doesn't it? Mm. But just to be told it'll be okay. Right? Because I don't know. I'm, you know, like a lot of people, I'm really, I was really attached to the outcome. Right? Save everything. How much can I gain? Not money, but how much can I gather? How much can I support my kids? How much can I help? And I, and I don't know how many people have a problem with I used to have a real problem with the thought of death, dying. Right. I remember. We talked right? about Right? Because it, when I was like in my early 30s and got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after being a longtime athlete, right. felt vulnerable for the first time. I go, there's an end. Like, there is an end for everybody. I know it seems silly to be in my 30s to think about that. Mm. But in that sent a lot of anxiety to me in going, what happens to my family? And what happens to what all I've built and grown and saved? And right. do you take it with you? And religious is a whole, religion's a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. But it was literally, and it was bad, mm-hmm. right? And then every time you went through a bad moment, is this going to be the end? And it was just a lot of peace to know, no, it's, you'll go through this. Mm-hmm. It'll be different, but it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. So if anybody else feels that way, keep yeah. listening. Yeah. Right. Who knows what we'll stumble well, upon next. the more next. we go and the more of these we yeah. do, we'll and we'll have some other folks on too and we can talk about it. But yeah, I think that's the whole idea is that you're not alone. You're not alone. The problem today is we play too much identity politics. And so what that creates is tribal behavior. Everybody thinks they're different because they look different or they speak different. Or, and, of course, there's money to be made off of that. You can create a lot of money by creating tribal behavior in people. What, what value? What, who, who's go, who do you need if, if we don't feel all, we're all separated? We're not all at war with each other. That was the thing about the grappling school, too. I used to say it was like the United Nations. I had every shape, color, and everything else of everybody. We had people who were professionals. We had people who were uh, convicted felons, had, <laughs> had served time in prison. We had cops. They'd all train together. Yeah. Right? Um, teachers, doctors, teachers, lawyers. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, yeah. construction workers, whatever. Bricklayers. I mean, we had them all. Yeah. And the thing is, once you, once you let all that external crap fall away, you find that, are you really any different? Not really, but as long as you see yourself by the external surfaces, then you believe you're different, and then you start, you get into those tribes where, okay, there's us, and then there's them, but the truth is, they're not any different than anybody else, just just the exterior, you know, you're not, re- everybody's going through a great battle, I don't care who you are, and that's one thing about being in practice as long as I've been in, I treat millionaires, and I treat people who don't have literally two nickels to rub together right and what i found was it's easy to look at the guy who's got the money and whatever and and be hating on the guy and say well look, you know what look what he's got or look what she's got or when you know him like i know him and i get to know people on a deep level yeah you start to realize you wouldn't trade with them my dad used to say when my dad was alive he'd say the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence but it's just as hard to mow they're struggling too differently maybe now, that's hard. If you don't have enough money to pay the heat bill, you don't know where your next 
it's pretty hard right. to look at the guy who's a millionaire and go, oh, boy, you're struggling. I had this experience. I was in Southern California once. I dropped out of, uh, left college and just went there and was like homeless for a while and got saved by a couple of buddies of mine who lived out there. Otherwise, I don't know what would have become of me. And I was in Laguna Beach, California with an old friend of mine who lived there. This is wealthy place, right? And I, and I joined a little local gym and... Um, they had a board up, and it had all kinds of different things. And one of the things it had was a support group, trust fund support group kind of thing for rich kids who had been, who had trust fund. Now, dude, I can tell you, I was so disgusted by this. Trust funds. Boy, your life is real hard. Well, I got to know a guy who we were, got to talking, and he goes, you probably think uh, how ridiculous this is or how, you know, how stupid little rich kids. And I said, yeah, pretty much, dude. He goes, did you know your dad and mom? I said, yeah, 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 of course. And um, my dad had just died, but my mom was still alive. And he goes, was, were they around for your child? He goes, yeah. He goes, I never knew my parents. My parents are still, but I was raised by nannies. I was raised by, he goes, I never knew my father. He goes, um, I, I, I lived in a $4 million uh, prison, basically, yeah. right? He goes, I'd give anything if, I could, if my father would have given a shit about me or my mother could have been bothered to care he goes now you don't have any sympathy because i he drove like a freaking two hundred thousand dollar car this guy but i thought about my life and i thought back on my life and i thought i wouldn't trade with this guy honestly he had all the money in the world but he didn't have what i had as screwed up as my family life was i wouldn't trade with that guy but until i met that and saw that for myself so it's easy to point the finger at the other person and go well you're you're this and you're that well i'm kind of smiling not because of that story but man don't we always want what we don't have always <laughs> yeah the object so if you of got money and no be, right if you have money and no family and i have a family and no money you want what i have and i want what you have i always want what you order for dinner Oh, I'm the same. It's damn never way. what I ordered for dinner. I'm the same. Ask my wife. I'm the same. If I'm having dinner, if we're all three having dinner, should have got what you got. God damn, I should have got what he got, right? I don't even want her to order the same thing I did. I want her to order something different. Right. So to see if it looks different than mine. So, yeah, it's I'm terrible. Perpetu- well, the, somebody once said that your object of desire has to be perpetually absent because otherwise you can't desire it. You cannot want it any longer. Makes sense. Right? Once you have it, you don't longer need it. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't desire it, right? So the, maybe the trick is, and I'm not the first one to say this, but people say, well, you, learning to desire what you already have. Right. That right? goes full circle into that internal happiness. Right. Your life goal of figuring out what makes you happy. Mm-hmm. You're chasing things, but you don't even know what. Might be the new car, or might be the degree. Well, my opinion is, is because we've grown so accustomed to living such a spoiled, selfish life that we forget what real needs are. For the most part, we don't need... uh, Look, you and I right now, we could go and in five minutes, we could have access to more food than we could eat. We could make ourselves sick eating it. That's how much food is available to us, right? I could go out right now and drink out of the the drinking fountain until I threw up. Clean water, by the way. We have clean water. I have access to sanitation, toilet, indoor plumbing, whatever. Right. You're driving a whatever fancy truck. I mean, so it used to be for most of human history, survival was what gave life meaning. Literally, your right. physical survival. You had to have shelter. You had to have a way. You know, and no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save you. You had to, you had to physically build the place and maybe maybe kill your dinner or if not plant the garden i mean that's so now we've we've moved beyond all that we don't have those worries now we're asking what gives life meaning i don't know well now i want the rolex watch or maybe i want the fancy car i want the better computer i want this i want except those are empty there's no there's no intrinsic value in any of that stuff so now we've got a society who lives as affluently as any society has ever lived And we are one of the most sick societies that's ever existed. We're sick. We're emotionally, psychologically, mentally very, very, very sick. And we don't know it. And what do we seek for the for the treatment, the cure, the very thing that makes us sick? I heard a guy the other day say you can't find your 
freedom and your enjoyment and the meaning in your life in the very place where you lost it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can't. It's not there. So for me, the only thing that I can tell you that I value is my friendships, my relationships with my family, with my friends. And those are that's a tricky thing too because that's also where I can be hurt. Right. You can't hurt me in business. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I don't care. I've already given it all away. I don't right. own nothing. Like... It means nothing to me. I don't care about any physical whatever. It doesn't matter. But when I, t- when I think of you as a friend or I think of you as a brother or so, and you betray me, I feel injured by that, right? So that still right. goes the on. The closer That's, I let you in, the more you can hurt me. Yes. And that's still, you know, Abraham Maslow said to be a fully actualized human being is to be free of the good opinion of others. It's a fancy academic way of saying you shouldn't give a shit what other people <laughs> think, right? Right. But I do deeply. And so when I try to when I try to find my happiness and my value, I try to find it in other people in the relationships I have. What I've learned now is if somebody rejects that, that's no reflection on me. That's a reflection on them. That's who they are as a person. That's their own problem, not my problem. You know? Because I've you and I both know some people who trained who've really stabbed me in the back for yeah. no good reason, right? Like, I didn't, what did I do, really? And they stabbed me in the back. That's who they are. It's not who I am. Right. It's not who I am. You put yourself out there every day as a coach, as an educator, as a teacher, right? The whole thing. Yep. Family man. And I, I know, because I've known you so long, I know that there are times where you've felt betrayed. Yeah. Like, how can you do that to me when I've done this I mean, we, it's a right. common experience oh, right. with a lot yeah. of people, right? The truth is it's got nothing to do with you. It has to do with them. You know, my buddy Kurt always talks about it's fear that gives rise to those things. Some fear in them caused them to do that. They have a fear of something, maybe lack, limitation, maybe whatever. Maybe they're afraid to get hurt, so they're going to hurt you first right. before you can hurt them, right? And I've had people hurt me, Terry, for absolutely no good reason. Like, there was no point. They didn't. They gained nothing. And that used to really hurt me. I mean, I would really feel badly about it. It's when you realize maybe that's just the root of who they are. It's, it's something inside And now them. you need to be away from them. When, yes, exactly. But I don't need to hate them, and I don't need to, to hold this animosity. You just because, need to be away. Yeah, I just need to be away. And, and you know what? Let them, God bless, go on with your life, do whatever it is that you do. I don't want to be held toxic. You know, I don't want to be held uh, as a hostage to that toxicity. Because it's killing me. You know, they say resentment is like drinking poison, hoping it kills the other guy. Right? Right? That's true. So, but hopefully we'll go on and uh, we'll continue. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. But I think, you know, so thanks for doing this first one. And once again, I leave with a full mind. Right? Of many a things scratching away in there to think about. So I appreciate our time. Yeah, man. Well, we'll do another one and uh, hopefully we'll get some more guys. And I think if we get, if we get some more guys and we know the cast of characters. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned because stay it'll tuned. be fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks buddy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.